Welcome to the Flat Earth Debate Uncut and After Show. I'm your host Nathan Oakley and if you are new to this channel or you've not done so already then be sure to subscribe. Hit the bell notification icon and join button if you'd like to become a Nathan Oakley 1980 channel member and keep up to date with the Flat Earth Debate. If you'd like to support the channel there is a super chat that runs alongside each of these shows while they premiere and there's also a PayPal, Patreon, Crypto and Thanks button in the info box below the video. Speaking of Patreons, I'm going to do a quick shout out to all of you who do support me on Patreon. So a massive shout out of thanks and appreciation to Giuseppe Montesano, Naughty Thumbnails, Mitch Kennedy, Original D-Rose, Rod, The Names Burley, Twad Wazzle, Jason Hornsby, Christoph Fournier, Flat Earth Travolta, J Mails 24, Yu Namento, M Iron 26, Endless, Goldie McKinnon, Retro Bill, Phoenix Rising 86, More Books, Canna Bear, Bogey, Michael Kahn, John Kays, Patrick Gunnels, Banter, Mel B. Styles, Troy Shuka, Harry Blade, Mobile Max 777, Rob W., Reese Pound, Del West Watson, Maria Nealands, Unbelievable Productions, Blue Ridge Ranger, Abraham Mohammed, Skeptic 936, Life is Short, Texas Mike, Tina Baker, David Wayne Foster, and Dank. So another massive thank you to all of you for supporting me on Patreon. In case you're wondering why I'm not on camera, I'm currently moving around some of the acoustic panels as I've just had a birthday and ordered a couple more. So I'm going to shove the newest one right behind me, so that'll be a new addition, although it'll be exactly the same, just slightly deeper, so it'll be three inches closer to the camera, which will make a massive difference. So with that, I'm going to hand over to whoever's on Discord and G+, so you can enjoy their dulcet tones while I set up, not set up with panels, but set up by pressing buttons for today's live show. A lot of Globers are actually are looking forward to it they are it's interestingly enough that they're really looking you know interested in in, in checking it out so see what happens yeah, they just want to see blood yeah they like that you know that, that yeah. flat on flat crying yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i'm nah, sure Nick is going to stream on his youtube channel too so yeah that yeah i'm gonna do yeah. that right right get right the views up man right I mean, that's, that's, you know, I even like told, I told even other server owners, like, dude, if, if you want to like, like live stream the YouTube in your discord, like that's fine too. You know, like if you want people going to your discord, like, Hey, wherever, just as long as people, you know, watch it, you know, one way or another. Cause, Cause Jaren has his YouTube as well, you know? Um, but I think he's going to just post the video on his YouTube. I don't know if he's going to live stream at the same time. And in all honesty, I've never been sub to Jaren. I don't know. I always had a suspicious since day one. I'm not going to go into this. It's just my intuition. Uh -huh. mm. Can't yeah. even say what. I never, I never liked him, you know? Right. I hear you. For whatever reason, you didn't. <laughs> I hear you. At the same time, I was always drawn to Nathan and Kiwi and these guys. It's as, as crazy as they are sometimes, you know? It's, it's, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Real. It's still real. That's all I'm going to say, bro. You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, matter of fact, um, Nathan Oakley, his show is the first suggested YouTube video that came up on my timeline. I don't even know why. Like I was not looking in the flat earth at all. Uh, I saw his, it just popped up as a suggestion. I was like, what? What's this flat earth? And I was like, that's fucking retarded. Like I, I legit like, dude, that's stupid. I was a space head like no other. I was like a glober glober. <laughs> and, oh, wait. Uh, how long, yeah. how long have you been flat earth, bro? Uh, now for I want to say since 2018, I think is the first time I heard Nathan Oakley hey, show. Same here. Yeah, 2018, and then I I actually he had like through YouTube it said like join the Discord right, and then I'm like Discord like what's that? I didn't even have a Discord account. I didn't even know what Discord was. So I downloaded the app, and I used to be a different name back then, and I which I forgot. I don't even know what like what email I signed up under, and then uh. I used to come into the room and I never talked to anybody. I didn't meet anybody. I didn't like say hi to no one. Like I was just like a nobody. Like I knew nobody. And I think I voice checked in maybe through Righteous. I don't remember exactly. It was a while back. But then, uh, yeah, 
and started watching the show and like the more I listened to it, like out of curiosity, like what the fuck is this conversation? But things just started clicking. Like the shit that Nathan would say with his panels and Arwen and like all them, the things they were saying was just like, it made too much sense for it not to be like, you know, our reality. Like for, for or you know, for it not to be however I meant that, but you know what I meant. <laughs> but um, I hope so at least. But when that, you know, when that, the more I looked into it, and then you, you know, when you once you start going down that rabbit hole, then you come across like Eric Dubay's like two hundred proofs. And I watched that shit, and I was like, "Whoa!" Like, holy, made me question everything. Then I started digging more and more. As time going on, then listen to QE. I just like, I was impressed. Honestly, it's like, wow, like these guys are really fucking smart. And they know what they're talking about. And then uh, that's when, like, everything, like, started just shifting. And then I pulled away from Discord for, like, a good six or eight months. I just stopped coming to Discord, stopped listening to the, you know, the, the YouTube, the Nathan Oakley show. Matter of fact, around that time, he started getting censored, I think. And I was no longer getting his notifications when he would, when he would come on. I was like, what the hell? I was tripping out on that. And, uh... He wouldn't come up as a suggestion anymore either. And I was like subscribe like I was like following him and subscribed to him and he still wouldn't pop up. That was weird, dude. I was like, what the fuck? And then and then it then I was like, oh yeah, oh yeah. If they're censoring this, like because I was like a big conspiracy guy to begin with. Maybe that's why it led me to Flat Earth, honestly. But I didn't, you know, I had notes because I knew like 9-11, all that bullshit, building seven, even building six, like all this stuff. Like and and I I ended up like I was like, okay, yeah, they're censoring it. Now that's saying something. Matter of fact, in 2018, 2019, they passed that that act, the um, Communications Act. And like, that was a big time censor. So I was like, okay, there's all they're doing to me is validating the argument. That's all they did to me. And then, like, you see the NASA video as a fake. And I'm like, holy, like, shit, I never, ever thought about before. It all just lined up like dominoes. And then I think after that eight month gap that I was gone, I came back and then I, I but I couldn't remember my login. So then that's when I created Apocrypha. And that was like in 2019, I think. And then uh, my yeah, I think so. Hey. Yeah, your mic's good. <laughs> that didn't clear. Continue. Uh, oh, yeah. So, so after um, I came back on, but then I, I forgot what happened, but I deleted my account. This is like right before COVID started. And then I came back again, like the following year. So I caught COVID. I was all, it was all bad. But yeah, it was, it was a weird little journey for me. <laughs> That's one good thing about COVID, right? Yeah. Freaking, I, I was so bored. I didn't want to just listen anymore. I wanted to figure out how to get on the show because I don't think I would even try if that there was no lockdowns. Hmm. True. Yeah. If anything, they thought that they were like, well, they did though. Like whatever they were, they whatever they planned to do, they did. Right. They got away with a lot of stuff and a lot of things were in the laws and we gave over a lot of rights over to NATO. Like now they're in control of a lot of things that we don't even you know realize. But but at the same time. It's almost like they also shot themselves in the foot because by doing so, it allowed everybody are. that was, yeah, it allowed everybody at yeah. home, you know, like bored, coming across the conspiracy. Th then, like, it spread like wildfire. So it's kind of like a, a double edged sword that they, they, they created there, which I think, you know, kind of. Hey, I ran into a guy in a train yesterday, just talking to him out of nowhere, a contracted guy, maybe in his late 30s. I asked him if you heard anything about flat earth. He was like, oh, yeah, but, you know, I'm not ready to go there yet. Because <laughs> I look up and, every, and everything else is round. Why are all the other planets round and we're flat? I said, no, see, that's where, that's where you don't have it. We're in the basement. Just make believe we're in the basement. And everything is above us. It's just Earth. Everything we see is lights in the sky. Throwing it out of your mind that we're in a solar system and we're freaking, um, what do you call it, uh, uh, orbiting. 
That's all bullshit. But think about the question about he gave, or the think about the answer he gave you. He said everything is round. That's not something people come up with. It's something that's seated in them. Right. He's heard that somewhere. Yeah, exactly. Someone's told him that. Yeah, that's very true, right? Just good, good, good observation. And then, and then, and then, I then broke that's down gas pressure without containment to him. He understood that. Mm-hmm. I think I think the the best rebuttal to that, you know, everything is round, so we must be round. Is that pool table analogy? Just because no, all the balls are that. round. I'm going to tell you, I don't do that one <laughs> because then that puts us up there. Got to let them know right <laughs> off the top, we are not up there orbiting. Get right. that pool table shit. I understand that part. We got to get them off the belief that we're in the sky with all of these planets orbiting. Right. Dave Weiss yeah. has got a nice True. comparison rather than pool table. He says, if you're walking through the forest and you're surrounded by trees, are you a tree? <laughs> Good one. Yeah, but fine, but you're still, he still has this up there. You know what I'm saying? Not really. Yeah, you are up there. If you say, that, well, yeah, well, I'm not. You're still in the system. Yeah, that's... I like that tree thing, though. Because then, true, you look up, you see a tree. It doesn't mean that you're a tree or on a tree. <laughs> I'm sorry, Nathan. That's like saying I see, we see too far. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Nathan, I'll send you that link a, a little bit later for the StreamYard. Perfect. Oh, today's the dreaded uh, day, huh? Like an hour before, I'll send it Perfect. to you. Right. I can't wait till Friday. <laughs> the review. <laughs> oh, I was going to ask you, did you have anything that you wanted to present? Or like show in video form or anything like that while you're, you know, doing it. No. Nah. Because you do have that option. You can if you need to. That's that's what okay. I was saying. I'm pretty lazy. I I've, I've I've got nothing to present. Just my okay. words. All right. That's that's all right. I'm just saying if if need be, it's that you can. So it's all good. I don't need anything, really. Excuse me. I don't need anything. Mm. I've got my I've got my yeah. I got my plan. I know what I'm going to talk about or intend to talk about. Cool. The way I envisage it going is uh, a barrage of questions about random scientific -y sounding subjects with me trying to keep on track talking about hypothesis construction. That's what I expect. All right. In the format, I, I went over it with Jaren. He's cool with it. Um, but one thing I haven't asked you guys yet. Did you guys want to do like a Q and a at the end? From listeners and you know people in chat and the YouTube and you know not really. if you want to do that we'll kind of no not really okay. well I run an open show okay. daily so <laughs> you know what I mean I'm there to talk to Jaron sorry <laughs> true 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 okay that sounds good and you guys take as long as you need to want to uh, it's going to be 12 p.m. for us I know it's going to just going to be getting later for you over there where you're at but as many hours or as many minutes whatever you guys decide it's totally up to you guys. Cool. But Thank we you. have really open it. open schedule. For sure. Oh, and if there's any other links that you wanted us to promote in the asylum description, you know, in the video description. Because if you look at it, uh Hammer already put like the the YouTube the Nathan Oakley 1980 as well as the Discord the F uh, Flatter the FED Discord but if you had any other links no, that's like, it. that you wanted okay no. cool. I mean the only thing beyond that is me begging which would seem inappropriate so no that's it my channel looks <laughs> fine right. all right cool no worries all right thanks it sounds like you're all over it it's good good good. Yeah, yeah, we, we 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 were going through it, and we did a dry run last night, making sure you know everything was cool. So it's all set up.
Cool. Good. Yeah, it means neither of us have to worry about it, basically. Very good. Nathan, right, you, right. Nathan, you'll be streaming on your YouTube, right? I'll, I may not stream it directly to the public. I may stream it to members and then release it later. Okay. Ominous silence after I state that. <laughs> okay, in case I decide to drop it, where is this coming out of? StreamYard? It's uh, it'll be in the asylum. Uh, Righteous just put the link. Uh, twenty three minutes after the hour, that's the YouTube. If you click on it, you you'll see it's like just waiting. It's gonna be like what seven hours or six and eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, six and a half hours. Um, but yeah, it, it'll, you could watch it through there. It'll be streamed. Um, it'll be live. Yeah, and it. So what we do is we have Streamyard. That's where Nathan and Jaron will go to, but then through OBS, he just sends it to the YouTube channel. So, just like that. The equivalent of you guys in G Plus Stream StreamYard is just the equivalent. Right. Yeah, I've been on StreamYard before with Flatsoid. Yeah, yeah, that's what you said. goes on StreamYard. <laughs> There you go. You see that image right there with the with the line across the moon? That's that's what the guy thought in the train there. How can we be wow. a flat planet when all the other ones are spherical? <laughs> they have that they have that image of, of a flat disc floating in a, a, a infinite vacuum, right? <laughs> Kind of like what they've been brainwashed to by the by the other side. Yeah, and no matter and no matter who goes on YouTube, that's what they come up with. <laughs> that just proves that they're stupid on both sides. <laughs> they're stupid on their own <laughs> side, and they're stupid from our perspective. They're just stupid. <laughs> yeah. Yo, D, that's what I was saying. I met somebody in the train yesterday. He heard about Flat Earth. I guarantee if I ask every single person in that car, I bet 70% of them have heard of Flat Earth topic. Of course, of course they have. Will they agree on it or look at you like you're crazy or, or ask you, don't tell me? You. That's another thing. But, yeah, everybody's heard of it. Like everybody's heard of mac and cheese. Everybody's heard of it, but not everybody likes mac and cheese. I got a chance to listen to the uh, Mitch versus pseudo Dr. Phil because I was mostly working most of the time and I heard y'all chiming in and everything. But I really got a chance to listen to it. And um, Mitch, Mitch, um, saw his ass a new one. Yes, he did. He did a good, he did a good job. My yes. favorite part is your best proof. Oh, that's going over the horizon. <laughs> Oh my goodness! Really? Well, crack me up when he said, "Well, yeah, I think I guess it's fair to account for um, flat surface." Um, in in this instance, I'll agree. That that's what I love right there. I'm going to show you what you claim. Yeah, that was that was an exemplary um, display of reversing the burden and. And like straw man's going back and forth because it was like it was like pseudo Doctor Phil was ducking everything and trying to like so what is the distance Mitch and Mitch was like I never said there was a distance he said well that's your claim he said no it's not he said no let me show you what your claim is right at the back right off the jump I was like wow look at this. it's a common strategy that they have yeah and it's often how they win if you bite. Yeah, Mitch was too smart for him. He knew he wasn't making any claims in that regard. And the moment Phil started to misrepresent some claim he hadn't made, Mitch was all over it. 
And, and just like that example you always say, how often do you beat your wife? You got to be like, whoever said I beat my I never said I beat my wife. That's it. I never said I beat my wife. So what, what kind of question is that? Who said I beat my wife? I didn't say I beat my wife. So why would you ask me some stupid question like that? It's a big enough question. Good morning. <laughs> what up, Tim? I think the question is, when did you stop beating your wife? It's a lawyer trick. Right. Who said I, have a, who have, who said I was beating my wife? never touched my wife. I never beat my wife. What are you, what are you talking about? Nathan, I'm going to post yesterday's uh, video review again for you today. It's a master B. That's all very quiet in here, isn't it? That's your all getting nice and warmed up. Unless we're not snoring. One more time, Adam. I'm just, I'm just coming. This, I'm just trying to get myself settled, but um, I've had to tell um, Ruthie to go and speak to Bev. Um, he, he seems to have bought a DeLorean, gone back in time to like 2019, 2020, and is now trying to get, <laughs> he's trying to get me to say that level is curved um, through citations from surveying. He's lost his mind. He's, Take him to the begging the question proof of nothing perspective hijacking earth curve calculator that was also proud of being able to reproduce all by himself and ask him about the surface level and eye level and ask him if they're bent. No, I just sent him to Bev. I says I'm not doing this. The <laughs> level is curved. Oh, now I think and, about and what you're saying. Oh, you no, were, that's much better. That much, much, much better. So your response is, uh, go to Bev with this garbage. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's given me a thumbs up to that. Right. Yeah, Bit of feedback there. Bev will affirm your bias is better than we will. Go to bed with it. When you win, you'll sleep better for one night. So yeah, go over to Bev. Very odd. That he's gone back to that. Fun oh, attempt. No, I was just going to say, he must have stepped away because I posted the video for review and I didn't hear a response from you. It's a master B. No, I didn't. I was, I was, I was doing things. Sorry. Yeah, I've got anyway, it. Anyway, uh, I want to give a shout out. I want to give a shout out to Steve Bauman. Make sure you show your face there on the live this morning because last night you claimed that FED never demonstrated, never explained explicitly or, uh, you know, vaguely anything about celestial navigation and the entire process. However, we all know, everybody in the chat knew that you had been around watching premieres for the past few years. So we would like for you to reiterate your claim that Brian and refractive curvature in particular don't know what they're talking about and Ruhif explained to refractive curvature how celestial navigation is performed upon a spherical surface and can be done on the spherical Earth. Steve, Bounce, I have a problem with an elevation angle on that curve. Brian, come and then go again. Odd morning. But D Rose, that guy ain't going to show up. Don't worry about him. So this is where, this is where I told him to go to bed. Um, there was one minute we were talking about celestial navigation. Um, and he's trying to weasel in, you see, and an admission of what level is in some description of surveying. 
Which I did read. I bothered to have another read after a few years. And how do they account for it? And they say, yeah, you know what? We don't. It's so negligible. We don't even account for it. Let me get it right. He was sending you a citation that says it's negligible. Well, I went, oh, he's just telling me level is curved in surveying, which, which is why I've disengaged, because we're not doing surveying. We're doing celestial navigation. If he wants to go and do surveying, go and talk to Bev. But well, I did bother to just read, and it talks about it. It, does, it shows you the maps, which are quite light. It shows you the claim and how they're invoking 7 over 6 R refraction to counteract some of the effect as well. Um, <laughs> and then the net result is... Yeah, we don't bother with it. As far as I can see, it's, it's so negligible, it's not worth affecting. So they just have all these double confused, it's like multiple horizons, just to pretend that it's there to then not do anything with it after they've demonstrated right. they've calculated it. Yeah, it's the magician it's, it's... waving his hand in the air so that you watch the hand. Watch this hand with terrestrial refraction. Watch this hand with tangent planes. Watch this hand with locally flat. Meanwhile, we Adam, don't use any of it. Adam, what they're doing there, and we've seen it, is they use globe language all the time because they have to say you live on a globe. But then when it comes to actual facts and doing things, it's negligible. If someone, anyone, says level is curved in surveying, run for the hills. Well, like, like Adam I've said, Sorry. well, I was just going to say, like you'd already said, it's like, no, if you want to rewind time and go back to 2019, then fine. Just don't do it here. You know, rinse and repeat somewhere else. Right. Even in surveying level is not curved. It's the language they use because they have, they have to somehow prop up the globe while they measure a flat plane. Yeah. My goodness. Or, or, Tim, they may be surveyors for golf courses. Look, I showed a picture of a roadway with a level curve horizontally, but it's flat. It's an S curve on a road, flat. So you say level surface, but curved road on level surface. That's obvious. But when you say level is curved, then you just destroyed the ability to communicate because now curve is level and level is curved, and you don't have any idea where the person is talking to you. They're two different words with two different meanings. <laughs> so stupid. Yeah, that's why they convoluted. That's why they convoluted to conflate the, um, the confusion. Well, in celestial navigation, why don't they use that curved surface? Why is it the equatorial plane that's flat? Why is it based on the vernal equinox where the whole uh, exactly. this, it, they never even use this level as curve. They just use level because they go to the equator. They never measure it from the surface. They even tell you that. So if level this curve, then why do you go to the equator? Why, why not use the curve? Why do we engage with these people? Just because they talk like this and, and they... Adam's a pharmacist. Well, he, he likes to administer pain relief. No, no, I'm not saying... Well, Adam's just toying with him. I know that, but it's No, like, that's not toying with him. That's potential pain relief. Like some yeah, crackhead. I know what you're saying. Like some crackhead. Two is at the pharmacist seeking pain relief. No, they all are. They all are. They have to deny the very essence of celestial navigation to hold on to their globe. That's right. Hey, can I say something? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, see, this is kind of exactly what some of the issue is about going in and speaking with Jaron. Uh, definitions. 
classification and clarification. This is an opportunity to show, to introduce to new listeners or newer listeners. Let's say APOC here. He just, he laid out a story about what happened with, with him. So he stumbled across the information. Someone didn't approach with the information. So that's a little different in getting the information. He stumbled across it and he chose to investigate because it was compelling enough. It held its own weight because the information had substance. It, he continued to investigate step by step more and more and it didn't let him down each step what's going to happen with jaron is an opportunity to define and clarify and classify these things like level we we all know it's ridiculous by the way it requires two points don't let them get away with one words like equidistant that's the real word want to get accurate you don't use these things actually surveying you'll get the spirit level slapped out of your hand if you bring that to actual men building that's a fact you will not be chosen to measure anything if that is what you your mouth says on the job site that this is level when it's equidistance this is important for new listeners to understand the differences between the def- what a definition is. So I'll say, Mitch, the way he, his demeanor was very effective because it was strong and he didn't disappoint. He was so confident. The truth is simple. It's so simple. It's the convolution and taking information and running around. And if you let the people that try to actually bastardize the information, just let them do what they do. Because anybody with a discerning ear can can see that these people are fools. What they're trying to do by saying level is curved. They have to have that. If that's good enough for them, in my opinion, they're not worth the chase. It's people like APOC who get the information and want more because they're curious. They're not defending something but something because of a psychological protection for whatever reason. APOC ditched his p- protection and went for, probably like all of us did, right? We're not trying to, anybody defending something, they're hanging on. You try to get people to let go when they want to hang on, it's, it's, it's not worth the time. So, but this opportunity with Jaren, and I know you're about to start the show, man, but I think it'd be great. Mitch handled it great. APOC was t- talking about how the information dominoed. That means bam, 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 and he's all the way on the other side before you know it. If you can, if you can navigate that verbally, and you can, Nathan. So I'm looking forward to what's about to transpire. Um, because because you know the the definition of level is the same in every dictionary. There's only one contradictory uh, definition, and that's in the Merriam-Webster's dictionary. Um, what? How would you respond to a uh, level being defined opposite to what they are in the dictionaries in, say, surveying manuals? How, how would he react? I, mean, it's not it's it's me. I could take a stab at it. If you're going to hold a globe belief, without an R value, but insist that you live on the sphere, then that definition fits that pseudo belief. 
but it's not real. So that one thing that Webster does is for the Globers without proof of a globe. So they say it, but there's no proof of the globe, no R value. So just because they capitulated and put that in there, that doesn't change for all time what level means and what curve means. They're opposites. They're not even. You got to have a brain. I respond differently. I just ask them, what is horizontal and how is that defined? That's exactly what I'd ask them. Because once they define horizontal and they state how they create horizontal, then I'd ask them, so how are you using this level that you're claiming is, is equidistant, from the center, equidistant from the center of a sphere? And they know the cost at that, at that, that a contradiction. Because when they do things like rise over run, which is changes in elevation, which is how you measure curvature, right? It, in within their, their uh, practice, within their discipline, curvature is a change in elevation. So how do you measure an elevation if all the horizontal distances between between the parallel verticals that you're using will all be parallel, all the horizontals will be also parallel to each other? That means they're all one horizontal, oh. just at different elevations. And nice. that'd be the end of that. Be over. Uh I've heard one response. I mean, it doesn't work, but they say reciprocating zenith angles. Can't have. I know. Can't have. What I just pointed out, you can't because the rise over one. Right. It's impossible. They can't measure elevation changes, which is what curvature is, is in surveying with diverging zeniths. Because every vertical that's used for the rise over run practice, which is how they measure all elevation changes from sea level, every single one of those has to be absolutely parallel. They can't be divergent. And what I like to know is when did when did um, Webster or whatever no Webster dictionary become the trigonometrical or geometrical dictionary? I mean, I mean like the dictionary to define and denote geometry and trigonometry. So. I can't wait till Friday. Good morning. Good morning. Hello, science proof things. <laughs> good morning. I gotta, good morning. I got. I want to start off with a song, if I can, just a quick two bars. It goes, I'm not falling, Earth's just rising. Some might call it quite psychotic, but I'm going to take that big leap of faith because Earth's rising up to meet me face to face. And please, I'll end on that. Please don't do that no more. Yeah, please don't do that again. <laughs> Any evidence of the distance to the sun? Well, I, I think uh, Dr. Phil said there was. He said 93 million miles, last I heard. I don't know. Phil said yeah, there was I have. that we make it plain. I have. Yeah, um, if we take the angular size of Venus and we compare that with the angular size of the sun, now, Venus, we know, is the same size as our globe Earth, which is a radius of 3959 miles. If we take all that and we compare the angular size of Venus when it transits the, the front of the sun, and we compare those angular sizes, we know it's 93 million miles away. And how we know it's 93 million miles away is we know the distance between Venus and the sun, and we know the distance between us and Venus. No, 93 million miles. You got the order wrong. I mean, we, we know the scale from Kepler's orbital motions. And then with the angular sizes, we can transpose in the distances if we've got something to scale with for distance, which would be, <clears throat> as you correctly identified, Hugen's assumption that Venus has the same R value as Earth. Yeah, because we know how we know the distance between us and Venus. Is because we know the distance between the Venus and the Sun due to their angular sizes. So, because we know the distance between us and the Sun, that allows us to tell the difference between us and the distance between us and Venus. And how we know the distance to the Sun is because we know the distance between us and Venus. Okay. Well, you pointing out all those begging the question fallacies that must be assumed in order to assert that you know the distance to the Sun by way of a whole series of presuppositions and assumptions. Would it be better if I took 
all of those as red. And then, on top of that, asserted that radar has measured the distance. Now, obviously, bearing in mind that we're going to take everything you've just said as red with all the assumptions and presuppositions in tow, therefore, the return signal from the radar that we send to the sun will come back in the time frame given to us by Kepler's third law and by Huygens' assumption that Venus has the same value as a spherical Earth. And then we'll know when the return signal will come and we can look there and lo and behold, it'll be there. So if I detach yeah. the example by way of radar with the same assumptions, would that be better? Yeah, because how we know radar uses the theory of speed of light calculation and how we know that's correct is because that's based on the average distance between us and the sun over a 12-month yeah. oh, right, 12 period. I mean, that's an extra layer. I mean, that's even better. Not only do we know when the return signal will be, we'll know how long the light's going to take to do that because of the orbital mechanics assumptions of Kepler and us moving around the sun and Earth having the same... We know all of that, and that gives us the speed of light. Therefore, we know the speed that it's going to take. We know the distance because of the assumptions with Kepler and Huygens. Therefore, we know the timings, and that's where we're going to look. And you know what? That's where they found it. Exactly where they thought it would be. What do you know? Yeah, the maths work. Exactly. Maths work perfectly. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, it. Jobs our, are good. Our, our calculation is spot on. That our, our average calculation is spot on. Yeah. The average, for the, two, on. the average for the two-way speed of light you're referring to, right? Do you want to just elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, yeah. Our, our four pre-assumptions and two averages create a very precise calculation uh, with that we'll call a measurement. Measurement, that's right, yes, measurement. Excellent. Well, we're there. Wait, I want to, I want to know. No, I want to know. I want to know. So we we asking for the distance to a presupposed ball of gas in a vacuum? No, we don't have to ask that. No, Hugens did it for us. It was absolutely ingenious. Okay, got it. Cool, cool. Yeah, don't, don't worry your precious little head about it. What are you doing? Hugens has done all that for you. You don't need to worry yourself. What are you concerning yourself with this stuff for? Hugens was very, very smart. As was Kepler. These are very smart people. Yeah, much smarter than any of us. We should never question them. Far smarter than all of us combined, I think you'll find. Those presuppositions and assumptions are ingenious. There's no other word for it. Yeah, if there, if, if there was 10 of us, they're still all much smarter than us. Nathan, I'm, let Arwen in. He yeah. wants in. Sorry, a bit behind it, guys. Are we are we talking about uh, bouncing a form of light off a black body? That sounds uh, problem. Never mind that. Oh, yeah, I was going to say, never mind that. <laughs> never mind that. <laughs> <laughs> Short pause where I thought of a response and I couldn't. Yeah, that's the position the ballers find themselves in with a similar response that they would get from Adam. What's a black body? What? Sounds sexy. It does. Sad sadly, it just means you're not going to get. Uh, it's just going to absorb everything, and you're not going to get a rebound. Uh, that's their definition of the sun, not not mine. But that's why you see when you do that, and you as the research team do all that and set it all up. When you can't find it, that's when you got to call the experts to show you where the thing was that you had predicted where it would be. That even though you couldn't see that it was there, through a little gentle persuasion, you could see it. Black bodies can do anything white bodies can do. It's an outrage. This suppression will not stand. I'm on one knee right now. <laughs> what are you doing in your own time zero or business, Adam? <laughs> Any evidence of a self-perpetuating molten iron core at the centre of a presupposed spherical Earth? You know, where we get the angles from hell from. We've got to incorporate yeah, we those P waves and S waves. P waves and S waves, I heard. Pray tell, what does that mean? Yeah. Yeah, well, we just send signals down and then we get signals back and it shows that it's bouncing off of something. Yeah, P does waves not, and S waves. Does it not measure return angles? Ah, oh, damn it. Yeah, you're going to need a flat earth for that. I mean, it doesn't work anyway. They've got all the predictions for the Kohler borehole wrong in terms of what they thought they'd actually drill through and 
if they've got it wrong based on an eight, what well, not eight mile, I think it's just over eight miles, 12, 13 kilometers, something like that. At that point, if you can't get that right, how are you going to know what's at the center of a presupposed spherical Earth? Absolutely absurd. They're measuring a flat plane. They're getting returns to signals that are angles, angular in nature. Yeah, flat plane required. Okie dokie. Something we haven't covered for a while. We're going to do a video on today, which is, and obviously, like always, let them know. Oh, why is it doing that? Let them know. At Nathan Oakley 1980 sent me. And I'm going to stick a link to this videographer's excellent material, which we'll be covering momentarily. I have no idea if it's good or not. I haven't seen it. Tenth's recommended this. Um, so yeah, there's a link going by. Go and let them know. At Nathan Oakley 1980 sent me. The idea being that if we share the algorithmic love with New Horizon TV, hopefully, were they to respond, like anybody else we cover, they'd share the algorithmic love back with us in return and put a little link to our video. But let's get into it, unless there's a little preamble that you want to give first, Tenth. Yeah, I think uh, Brian's going to love this video. I wish QE was here. He's going to love this video, but uh, it's pretty self-explanatory. You know, I absolutely despise Coriolis, right? Well, we're going to use airplanes, so don't worry about it. Coriolis. Earth rotates. I've got an objection already. Yes, no, undoubtedly this will be Globiolis, Adam. Yes, because the title, which I should have said already. Does Earth's rotation affect the aeroplane's speed and flight time? That's the name of the video. If it's true, let's just get this straight off the bat. If it's true that Earth is a non-inertial turning reference frame, turning underneath the stars that, according to the heliocentric globe Earth claim, aren't the thing that are turning when we see them move through the night sky. It is, in fact, us turning beneath them as a second non-inertial turning reference frame. This is claimed to be the Coriolis effect. It is the effect of something like a gyroscope spinning in free space and showing the Earth is actually turning underneath it to exhibit a 15 degrees an hour deviation in the gyroscope because it's spinning in free space as Earth turns underneath with the cage attached. Now, if... <coughs> excuse me, I don't want to frog in my throat. One sec. If Earth is turning underneath gyroscopes and if Earth is turning underneath the stars to exhibit 15 degrees an hour of deviation, then Earth is turning underneath aeroplanes, shortening their flight times. You can't have it both ways. You can't have Earth simultaneously turning underneath gyros and turning underneath pendulums and turning underneath the stars, but not turning underneath helicopters, gyroscope, uh, gyroscopes, uh, drones, hot air balloons, aeroplanes, or anything else that is claimed to be leaving a non-inertial turning reference frame. So, it's clear from the off. What is Coriolis effect? The globe Earth claims to have it. Coriolis effect is the not actual deviation of a projectile moving through an inertial reference frame as observed by an observer on a non-inertial turning reference frame. That is to say, you on a roundabout, spinning around, watching two other people not on the roundabout toss a ball between them back and forth. From your vantage point, turning underneath, you will see the ball seem to take a curved path. That seemingly curved path is the apparent deviation described in Coriolis effect. Ergo. If Earth has Coriolis effect, then you look up at a plane and go, ah, oh, what do you know? It looks like it's taking a curved path. And Joe Bloggs next to you says, no, Nathan, it's actually Earth turning underneath to make the plane look like it's curving, like the stars look like they're moving. It's actually us turning underneath. The consequence being... The Earth's turning underneath aeroplanes. That's shorten their flight times. Obviously, it doesn't do that. We don't have any Coriolis effect. We do observe stars moving, but it definitely ain't the Earth turning underneath that's inducing that effect. If they claim the effect, which is claimed to be Coriolis, they'll state it as a drift at 15 degrees an hour. Well, how much would the plane be affected? I'll give it you in their terms. 15 degrees an hour is how much it'd be affected. That's how much. 
and you could calculate it with a rotational rim velocity at 1,000 miles an hour on the equator. That is to say the Earth would be turning underneath aeroplanes to the tune of 1,000 miles an hour if Earth is exhibiting Coriolis effect. For you to look at the plane and go, oh, what do you know? It looks like it's curving. When in reality, it's us turning underneath to induce a not actual effect. We don't see it. It's not happening. Earth doesn't exhibit Coriolis effect. All we see is star movement. It's got soddle to do with Earth moving. Earth isn't moving. Let's get that out of the way straight away so we all know that we're on the same page about what Coriolis is and whether or not Earth has it. It doesn't. Any comments before that's, we play? That's why more I than, uh, that's more why than I three uh, seconds. Because Go on, Adam. We've got two reference frames. One moving and a pseudo force in Coriolis. But I've got a smelly feeling we're going to get one reference frame, two applied tangential forces, and we're going to calculate the differential between them both. Globiolis, as it's Globiolis, known. indeed. It rotates eastward, but does it affect the speed of the airplanes or other flying objects? Does it speed up or slow down airplanes flying westward or eastward? We're into a begging the question fallacy already. Does it, what, the turn of the Earth you are assuming does happen? So we're already assuming that Earth is turning in this example. Why are we automatically assuming that Earth is turning in this example? Is it going to be an apologetic for why we do not see an effect of planes having any effect of Earth turning beneath them, like with Coriolis? It'll be an apologetic for why we're not seeing that. So why are we assuming it even happens? Why are we assuming Earth's turning immediately? He's just validated me. got a point out before we go on with the video. He's just absolutely validated absolutely everything I say about the London to Aqua flight. Okay. Uh, Nathan, could you let me in the G plus panel already? I'm going to go with no. No. Why would I? Absolutely outrageous. Oh, of course okay. you can, Owen. I'm sorry I didn't let you in already. Go ahead. Join in and I'll let you in now. Stay at this point. Come on, Arwen. What's taking you so long? Bloody hell, it's like we wait around for Arwen all day long. He asks to come in and then he's not even at the door knocking. No ding dong, no bell, nothing. What an outrage. I don't know about the ding dong. Uh, yeah. I'll check with Arwen, then we'll get on. Can we hear you? Say hello. Hello. You're good. It appears that airplanes flying westward in the opposite direction of the Earth's spin move. That we're going to assume immediately. Where was that proven? Why is that assumed to be the case? Faster than airplanes flying eastward in the direction of the Earth's spin. But actually, it does not happen. Yeah, Earth's not turning. That's the end. Well, that only took 33 seconds. If Earth was turning underneath those planes, you'd notice. We don't. Earth's not turning underneath the planes. In fact, the airplanes flying in the eastward direction receive a booster, which will be explained at the end of this video. As the Earth spins, everything inside, on the surface, in oceans, and even the air also moves. Really? So, you're saying that unbonded gas moves with something it's not attached to. How is that possible? Given that we've got all of this gas sat next to a 10 to the minus 17 Tor vacuum. Now, based on the second law of thermodynamics, the gas would fill this space. But what you're saying is, rather than gas following natural law and vacating into any area of volume it has available to it, it actually somehow velcros itself to a turning reference frame and doesn't escape into a sky vacuum. That's utterly absurd. Earth completes one rotation around its axis. In Sorry, that's the third time he's begged this question. You keep telling us about how it's doing it, but you're about to get into how it doesn't affect anything and we don't see any effects of it. No, it just doesn't happen. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, um, just on a minor way, well, a major point uh, is that what he's claiming there, whether he has said it or not, which he probably did, did, won't say, is he's claiming the conservation of angular momentum. Because they can only claim angular momentum, uh, the conservation of angular momentum, because they're dealing with a body that's moving at an angular rate. Now, to conserve angular momentum, you must be physically attached to the surface of the body that's rotating. Now, gas is unbonded. It's not attached to anything. 
There is no attachment to gas. If there was, wind would be impossible. <laughs> if we were rotating and the gas was attached to the earth, and uh, conserving the angular momentum be due to being attached, then wind, gas, all that wouldn't exist. It couldn't. There'd be no anything. It couldn't exist. It'd be absolutely... I just even to, to entertain the thought is, it, it, it numbs your mind. It's just like, no, nah, you don't know just what you're on, talking about. Just on top of what Brian's saying there, we've seen when we look up in the sky, uh, clouds moving in different directions because at different height, the wind is moving at different directions. And we got northeast, west, south winds and cross winds, quarterly winds. But if Earth, if it's moving all by one, it should only be going in one direction. So it's already debunked, and, and Brian's right. Yeah, I was looking at that yesterday. Just yesterday, I was looking at the clouds, uh, or last night in the sky, and they weren't all moving in the same direction, and they were all going at 15 degrees per hour, you know, uh, west to east. Yes. And one just, more, just, just, just one more. Just briefly summarize that. The multiple directions of surface winds debunks the notion that Earth's carrying its rotational value through the inertial reference frame we're supposed to see things drifting in is apologizing for why we don't see any drift basically by apologizing for earth definitely turning but simultaneously holding unbonded gas moving at the same rate but also moving in all sorts of different directions at the same time <laughs> it's just absurd just one more thing um if you go to certain golf courses or if you're near canyons you see trees uh Rather than going straight up, they're kind of like sideways a little bit. And you say, why is that? Well, because the the wind on a normal basis pushes it that way. Now, what if that's against the way the presupposed, begging the question, the Earth is rotating? It goes against that direction now? <laughs> it's so dumb. In 23 hours, 56 well, we minutes, Sorry. and four seconds. Just... On the surface. Well, what we've got here. Um is another claim within their, what I'd call fluid dynamics, what they're trying to invoke. Um, and we can apply that to liquids and gases. If you were to just put a spinning ball in a, uh, a liquid container, would, would the water, which is able to at least import frictional forces onto each other, well, would the water spin all the water spin at the same rate as the no. ball is spinning in the centre, or would we just get, no, we just get some translation. But what we wouldn't get is lock steppedness, even with an actual liquid. But this is what's trying to be claimed by fluid dynamics in this, what, whip and top. With a whip and top, the air around it moves at the same speed. It doesn't. You get a small interaction at surface level, and that's it. That's, that's because we're, We've got gas behaviour, and you cannot invoke this in gases. Let's say you can't really invoke it with liquids. You would see a loss of speed, and that's a practical demonstration you can do. But the um, examples but that's fundamentally giving, the claim. The examples he's giving are an apologetic for why we will not see any effect in this example. So you've got to go to Velcroed gas particles that are unbonded and fluid dynamics. And you're like... That's not how, number one, that's not how it works. But what, so if we accept that, it's being accepted so we understand why we won't see any effect. Well, not only that, but he's then destroyed his own claim of Coriolis because he's now invoked, instead of having the two reference frames, he's got one. So yeah. he can't express Coriolis with one reference frame. That's not the definition. Surface, the Earth's rotation speed is different across the globe. At the equator, the rotation speed is much faster, 1600 kilometers per hour. And so what, therefore, the air moving in lockstep knows to go a bit faster at the equator, does it? When it's unbonded. It's got sentience, right? It knows. It just knows. Uh, we're a bit, bit closer to the equator, lads. Better keep going. Oh, you guys, go in the other direction. Don't worry about it. And as you get closer to the poles, the rotation oh, speed gets slowed yeah. down. Yeah. So we've got the old one as well here, haven't we? So as we've just described that whip and top effect, then the Earth's rotating at a thousand miles an hour. So even if we assumed that we could translate that uh, energy to that first molecule, as the molecule 
gets further away from the surface that's going at 1,000, it's got to go faster to keep up to be in this supposed claimed lock steppedness. Right. First law of thermodynamics violation. violation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, I think it was actually me that was the first to point this out. The, but there we go. I'll just take credit where Brian would normally jump in and take it. So the... That was first. There we go. What? Go on, Eli. Maybe it's just unintentionally on mute, off mute. Um, yeah, as, as the Perhaps gas... you did bring it up, but I, I did I, I did notice, I, or I did at least ask you guys, uh, seeing as that they claim that they're... Well, not even claim. The, the, the winds up there are much faster. And they... I brought up some article. I'm, I'm drawing a blank now because I'm washing dishes and stuff. But the bottom line is uh, uh, the, the, there's, there's more energy coming from where? Is yeah. what I asked. And I, I think the answer was first it's a violation. Yeah, it is. It's first law of thermodynamics violation. As If you're saying that a gas particle comes out of the ground or comes out of a tree or wherever, it's produced at surface level, and then instantly at the equator, it's going at 1,000 miles an hour. Well... As you increase the radial value on a presupposed spherical Earth to make apologetics for why we're not going to see any effects whatsoever, why we won't see something that proves we're spinning, yeah, when we accept all that, the gas gets higher and has an increased circumferential value to travel. Therefore, to be in lockstep with something that's sphere-shaped and has a smaller radial value, it must increase its velocity to stay in lockstep with the sphere Earth below as it turns to apologise for why we don't see any bloody effects happening. Got to accept Does a big old it's... bowl of shite to digest this, really, haven't you? Does that mean when it's windy that the Earth stopped spinning? Or, or what happens when it's windy? It doesn't mean anything. Because the only reason we're being told this is to apologise for a non-effect happening. Oh, the planes aren't doing anything. They're not exhibiting anything. They're not demonstrating anything whatsoever to do with the Earth curve. But why, you ask? Nobody asked that. Well, no, but why? Well, because Earth is definitely turning and gas is violating the first and second law of thermodynamics and therefore we don't see any effect. We all cool? Super cool. Everything on the Earth is moving with it at the same speed. Newton's first law states that a moving object continues with the same speed and in the same direction unless... So the gas surrounding Earth, once it's moving in a direction, it's going to keep going. So therefore, the gas would fill the vacuum because it would just carry on in whatever direction it's going in. Maybe in your world, it hits the thermosphere and speeds up. Nevertheless, it's going to dissipate into space. That's what gas does. And you've just described how things in motion will stay in motion. Oh, gas moves in all directions, though, doesn't it? It would just dissipate into space. We'd all be dead. He just upon named a massive west to east wind if you're trying to go to the west. So, like, I remember bringing this up in the past. What that means is that if his globe is rotating west to east at 15 degrees per hour, then the air has to be moving with that at 15 degrees per hour. So if you're trying to fly... In, excuse me, in an airplane from the east coast to the west coast of the United States, then there has to be allowances made for the fact that you're flying through something that's coming against you. So it's not just normal air pressure. It has to be added pressure that you are fight, your plane is fighting against. It has to be. From what he's just said, from, that, from their whole uh, description, there's no way that airplanes wouldn't have to fight against that within that paradigm. By an external force. So external force is required to cancel the influence of the Earth's rotation speed. You are in motion as the Earth... All right, cancel Earth's rotation speed. So, so this is a whole explanation for how we're going to be cancelling out the effect that we'd see. I see. Earth moves at all times. If you jump in the air, you always land on the same spot because it does not change your speed to the Earth. What about gas? What if you let a helium balloon go? Right? Is that going to reattach itself to the Earth's surface? 
oh no, my bad. If the balloon's on the equator, it'll know that it's got to go a thousand miles an hour and increase in velocity as it gets higher and higher, right? To keep up with Earth's rotation belief, yeah? Because it's not going to show any effect. We're not going to see the balloon drift away at 15 degrees an hour. We're not going to have any Coriolis effect, right? No Coriolis. What happened to Coriolis? I thought that was a claim that proved Earth spinning. Here we are explaining why we don't have Coriolis. Interesting. Earth. If jumping in the air could change your speed to the Earth, you would be thrown hundreds of meters away from your starting point. Debunking that we spin. Because if you jump up and down on a roundabout, that's precisely what bloody happens. But it doesn't happen on Earth. That's because it's not spinning and we don't have two reference frames. Yet it's claimed to have two reference frames. Non-inertial and inertial. You're supposed to see a Coriolis deviation in the inertial reference frame, which is not the turning Earth. At 15 degrees an hour, it's supposed to be why the stars move. But yet, you jump up and down and nothing happens. Well, clearly that's not because Earth's turning. The same is the case of the air. What he's doing, just one second, Nathan. Uh, this is why I brought up uh, the conservation of angle or momentum, momentum early. It's because they're referring to a rotating body. That's that means that body only has angular momentum. Now, as I stated earlier, you can only conserve angular momentum by being physically attached to the surface of the rotating body. Uh, but what they're talking about now is linear momentum, the conservation of linear momentum. So this is the, the switcheroo they do with the public who don't know any different. Whereas the conservation of linear momentum, you can, up to a point, jump up in the air and conserve that momentum in a straight line and land more or less back where you were. It depends on how fast something is moving and the amount of momentum and the amount of time. But you can do that, uh, as proven by uh, Simon and Dan, right? But that's not angular momentum. Angular momentum is different. Angular momentum is what creates the centrifugal force, remember. So if you're at the, at the equator and you try jumping up in the air, uh, technically you should be getting thrown out the way as well as well as the body rotating underneath you. Because you're not attached to the physical body anymore and you have centrifugal force. Sure. So you shouldn't just have something rotating underneath you. You should be flung sideways. Sure. In the if we beg the question of why we're rotating and then accept this explanation for why we're not seeing any effects thereof, even though this claimed to be 15 degrees an hour drift, that this guy's explaining why we don't have it. We don't have drift, here's why. And that's Globiolus. The globe doesn't claim... Globiolus, because it would leave you with only one reference frame. No drift, no 15 degrees an hour to claim. Yeah, the consequence is that planes would have Earth turning underneath, so they have to explain why they don't have Coriolis with videos like this. Airplanes flying in the air. Now imagine an aircraft at the runway on the equator. Remember the Earth's rotation speed on the equator is 1600 kilometers per hour. It means that an airplane standing on the runway is moving with the Earth at the speed of 1600 kilometers per hour. So when it takes off and flies in the air, it retains the same speed. As per Newton's first law, an Show us. Show us a small scale example of that happening, please. It's never going to be done. External force is required to change the speed and direction. Go on. Yeah. What you'll notice is so far, he's not mentioned north to south and south to north. Basically, none of them ever, ever mentioned that. Because even if you take, even within their paradigm, if you take off at the equator and you're conserving at six, within fantasy, conserving 1,600 kilometers an hour, right, rate, then if you're flying, like, let's just say you're flying a, a, a southwest direction, then that means that the other, when you're passing over other latitudes, that you, you have to account for this southwest west direction, right? The uh, southwest direction uh, change in latitude, right? But if we forget about east to west altogether and go straight to London and fly to Accra, Ghana, then it doesn't matter what you're supposedly retaining when you take off in London, because to get to Accra, Ghana is a 3,000 mile flight. It takes six and a half hours. But Within their paradigm, because there is no, because he's not mentioned north to south and south to north, because they never do. Now, whether he will or not in the rest of the video, I predict he won't. Because within their paradigm, there is no conservation of the momentum they're claiming going north to south and south to north. Because there can't be. 
Right, because they are claiming the conservation of an angular uh, body or of a body moving in an angular rate of 15 degrees per hour. So if you're flying north to south or south to north, that means as soon as you pass the next latitude, then that latitude, if you're going especially from London to Accra, the next latitude is moving faster than the one that you took off from. And then one after that, faster again, as per a mile per hour rate, let's just say. So Accra can't be 3,000 miles away as a, of a journey uh, under those conditions. And you can fly directly due south from London. You would have to go at least south, east, southeast to meet Accra 6,000 miles away, somewhere over. You'd have to basically, your flight would have to take off, head over Skip Oil in, in Amsterdam, and head for basically the South Asia to meet up with, uh, with Accra six and a half hours later, which would also mean you'd have to be doing about 1,000 miles per hour, 900 to 1,000 miles per hour to uh, uh, complete that journey in six and a half hours. I just want to point so that, out also, it Brian, just destroys all of it. this example that they just had on screen, correct me if I'm wrong, comports quite nicely with QE's description of the plane literally flying backwards from the inertial reference frame. Let's just watch it. When it takes off and flies in the air, it retains the same speed. <laughs> it was! As for Newton's first law. They had it for a split second. The plane was flying backwards. Watch. The speed of 1,600 kilometers per hour. So when it takes off and flies in the air, it... There. Watch it fly backwards. Retains the same speed. Backwards. So the plane's flying backwards. As I observe it from the inertial reference frame. Takes off and flies backwards, does it? What a load of nonsense. As per Newton's first law, an external force is required to change the speed and direction. The force of engines move the airplanes and the Earth's rotation speed has no influence on the airplanes. The Earth's rotation has no influence. So after two minutes and 30 seconds of a three minute 15 video, the conclusion is actually arrived at. There is no effect. So I'll give a rephrasing of his conclusion. We don't see any Coriolis effect. Earth is not exhibiting any Coriolis effect as claimed. There's no effect to be observed. You want a baller to tell you. ...force is required to change the speed and direction. The force of engines move the airplanes and the Earth's rotation speed has no influence on the airplane's speed. And the Earth's rotation speed, what Earth rotation speed? The one that would definitely influence aeroplanes. Has no influence on the aeroplane. Oh, well, then it would be an influencing factor if Earth was turning. You'd notice it. It's claimed to be noticeable. It's claimed to be a 15 degrees an hour drift that we'll all observe. We're claimed to have Coriolis on a turning Earth. So it's claimed to be observable. Observable at 15 degrees an hour. What's that you say? We don't see that effect. Oh, right. Globe Earth Coriolis debunked. We're not turning. If we were, we'd see 15 degrees an hour drift in this example. We don't. Like we're supposed to see in gyros and pendulums and the stars. But yet we don't see it. That's because it's not happening. The fact that you had to reiterate three times that you still assume Earth spinning when apologising for why there's no effect of that doesn't mean that there's an Earth that's still turning. There isn't. There'd be Coriolis effect like he's claimed. Nathan, this is so a good time for the audience to... Sorry. This is a good time for the audience to exercise discernment. If the Earth is turning a thousand miles per hour at the equator and the airplane is going backwards because it got off the Earth, as Brian says, it's not attached anymore. And then he says the engines of the airplane uh, offset that. Uh, a commercial airliner's maximum, I think, is about 550 to 600 miles per hour, but he's going backwards a thousand. I mean, we got a split second of the plane going backwards on his little edit, probably because as he made the video, he looked at it and went, hmm, that looks a bit wrong. Plane's going backwards. So we'll have it take off. I'll make my example. Let's cut to the next frame. But that's how they, hence, that's how they make up for the non-rotation underneath the plane. Yeah, this plane. is why I don't deal with north, east to west and west to east. I only deal with north to south and south to north. Because right. there, there's no Coriolis involved. There's no Globius Coriolis involved. That's why I'd only deal with that. No, no Coriolis, you say? Nothing. No Coriolis, you say? 
but they claim to have a 15 degrees an hour drift, don't they? The globe, that is. Yeah, the globe is supposed to have, which would mean, the, the point is, is that for the east to west and west to east flights, they can make up this nonsense about this conservation of momentum and then want to argue with you for two hours about what Coriolis is, right? Whereas east, north to south and south to north flights, they can't bring any of that into it. Because yeah. within their paradigm, there is no explanation for those flights. Right. There and as you, as you just to summarise as well, Brian, before you no say it all again, it. just one sec. As you correctly identified, the way they do that switcheroo is with linear versus angular momentum. The inference is that as something turns off, takes off like a gas <laughs> from a spinning reference frame, in this case, the presumed turning Earth that's going to show no effects then it will retain the velocity as it turns around with the thing that was turning that it's now left. But that's not conservation of angular momentum. That would be to say that something that's taking off will retain the 15 degrees an hour rotation like the Earth is rotating. So you retain it. But they then go on to describe, again, as you very succinctly detailed earlier, linear momentum. In other words, it's following a path alongside something that is rotating with an angular rate but in a linear fashion. It's like, no, these two things, number one, aren't the same. Number two, they don't, you're never going to give me an example of that actually happening. Again, thanks to Adam, he's gone through it with, a, with a, an idea with, I can't remember what he used, a whisk or a mixer or something like that. But you, could get, you get the idea. You're not going to see it even with liquid, let alone gas that's in his own bloody video, according to Newton, going to bugger off in whatever direction it's travelling. Yeah, it will. We'd all be dead. The gas would fill the sky vacuum. Thanks for pointing that out in this video. Added bonus. He's also debunked space with Newton. All right, so it's going to remain in the same motion, in the same direction, in the same trajectory. Yeah, that's how gas behaves. Of course, that would mean we'd all be dead and we'd have a 10 to the minus 17 vacuum at sea level. We'd all be dead. Adder, well, before whether we an all die, just, just, just a real quick, Brian, before we all oh, die, yeah, can you... Can you tell me how Wolfie uh, from the cockpit of the airplane was contacting the tower about the people in Coriolis again? Well, Wolfie's claimed to be correcting for Coriolis drift because he's an idiot and doesn't understand that Coriolis deviation is only capable of being observed, the illusion thereof, from a turning reference frame. Ergo, uh, if you're in an aeroplane travelling over something like a roundabout and the bar in the roundabout's looking at the plane going, oh, what do you know? That plane looks like it's corkscrewing through the air because I'm turning on a roundabout, then you don't need to radio up to the plane to tell them to account for the illusion of drift seen from a turning reference frame. Now, what a plane would have to do if Earth was turning underneath to give the impression from the ground, as you turn, as is claimed, that the plane's drifting at 15 degrees an hour, would mean that the plane would have to account for Earth turning underneath for you to see the illusion that is claimed to happen. That's Coriolis effect. But we don't see that 15 degrees an hour drift. So what do we get? We get apologetics that beg the question three times, reassure the audience that we're definitely still turning, even though we won't see any effect. There's nothing to see here. Why? Uh, well, because of a first and second law of thermodynamics violation and a convolution between linear and angular momentum. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, there's, their claim, you see, the, all of their claims right, concerning what they try to call Coriolis, which is not the Coriolis effect, it all has to be based and can only be based around east to west and north and west to east because they are trying to explain a way how the stars appear to rotate, whereas they're trying to claim it's not rotating west to east, but it only appears to be, right? Now, because of airplanes and hot air balloons and stuff, right, uh, especially with airplanes, they have to change that narrative and say, well, there's a conservation of momentum. And as we've been pointing out, it's they're, they're, they're convoluting between angular and uh, and linear, right? But the, this is why I keep harping on about uh, north to south and south to north. They are all of their claims within this, this video here, right? Everything that they're claiming here and everyone else that makes these claims, they're only based east to west and west to east, not north to south and south to north. So there is no conservation of momentum happen within their paradigm other than the latitude that the plane takes off at. So the latitude that, that ACRA is at is just at the equator. So the ACRA is claimed to be moving at 1,035 miles per hour, whereas 
the plane that takes off at London is supposed to be moving at, I don't know, 700 miles per hour, whatever it is, right? So when that plane is, has to, is taking a direct north to south, a due south direction, there is no conservation of momentum happening. It's only happening west to east and west, west, east to west. That's why I keep pointing out that flight, because they can't argue about Coriolis because it's not involved. Coriolis's rotation there is to do with the stars, east to west, right? They can't argue about conserva angular conservation of momentum because the only conservation of momentum, ha momentum within their paradigm that's happening there is the, from the latitude the plane is taken off at. The Earth, if it was rotating, must rotate underneath the airplane, right? As Neil deGrasse Tyson pointed out with that football example in the north to south, when, when, the, goal, when, when the, 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 the famous kick that won the Super Bowl, that famous uh, score, uh, goal that, that happened for the Super Bowl, when he said he'd done some calculations and it was because the Earth rotated underneath the, airplane, underneath the football, that's because it was north to south or south to north, whichever. So when it comes to airplanes, there is no answer as to why the Earth is not rotating underneath that airplane north to south and south to north, because they don't have any. So they keep on wanting to talk about east to west and west to east and conservations of momentums and argue with us for five hours about what the Coriolis effect is, right? trying to insert Globiolis, when all of that is nullified by that one flight from London to Accra. Nothing. Because that flight has to take, or would ha has to, the pilot can't fly due south, which is exactly the direction they fly to get to Accra, and they can't just take six and a half hours to get to Accra, which is 3,000, just over 3,000 miles, because they'd have to travel a completely different route towards South Asia, right, and fly for over 6,000 miles, and, how, and they can't do that within six and a half hours. They don't do that. They don't account for any of that. None of that happens. They just fly due south for six and a half hours, directly due south, and uh, because of London and Accra are basically on the exact same longitude line. And they, and they arrive in Accra six and a half hours later. Right? They don't, uh, they don't fly that extra three, three, over 3,000 miles and take a route towards South Asia. They don't do that because they don't have to do it. And even if they try to do it, the airplanes, not even the fastest commercial airplane in the world, tank is a couple of hundred miles too slow to even make that journey. So they don't have any of that with that flight. And in conclusion, and, Earth isn't turning. The only way you can have these flights that would have to be negating a non-force force and a conservation of momentum that doesn't occur north to south or south to north What's the conclusion? They don't have an answer because there isn't an answer needed. There's a non-effect being described. We're apologising for why something isn't happening. So we just don't assume that the globe Earth's turning and we don't have to apologise for anything. It's not turning. We'd notice. Well, just something I said to Ben, to book conspiracy, and I'm not sure if he fully got it, but you know his videos where he's showing the stars move? Uh, when they shouldn't move or in directions they shouldn't move if we were flying over a rotating globe. I told him if he can get video of a flight that's going directly north to south uh, in nighttime video and those stars move east to west in that video, then that means 100%, no argument, no way to argue it, the Earth is stationary. Perfect. Because, yeah, you understand why, don't oh, you? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Perfect. Uh, shout out to Godzilla thirty seven who says if you're look if you're taking on Geron and Earth Geography Office, you must be wary of the latter. The ego is what you'll have to beat. I don't really follow what that means, Godzilla thirty seven, gotta be honest. But thank you for the super chat. Uh, I know what that means, but uh let me just say, Brian, not every football game in America is a Super Bowl. That was just a, a game. It wasn't a Super Bowl. I told my heart, it was a famous thing, famous goal, and um, Neil deGrasse Tyson, you know, supported exactly what I'm saying. So, no, the plane is moving right westward the... or eastward. It is always moving at the same speed to the earth. Oh, the, the little clip of the plane moving backwards again on the left. Let's have another look. Speed. So it does not matter whether an airplane is moving westward or eastward. It is always moving at the same speed to the earth. The only external factor that... Yeah, we only get a split second of it moving backwards. Yes, because it looks so stupid. ...that influences airplane speed is the prevalent wind. 
Jet streams are current of air caused by the Earth's rotation and temperature. So we've only got an eastward direction of winds? Is that right? Moving in the direction yeah. of winds. Come, Brian. You just said jet streams are caused by Earth's rotation. No, they're not. They're caused by convection. Convection currents cause, which is temperature, not to do with rotation. That's right. official. That's not me, just me. Either. Right. Baseless assertion because he didn't complete the affirm in the consequent, but yeah. Save fuel and time. The jet streams push the airplanes eastward, and this effect becomes more dramatic in winters. But if all of it's conserving momentum, it wouldn't be jet streams, it'd be all of it. Constantly, in one direction. Yeah, we've already covered this. Multiple surface directions, winds debunks this notion. That's it. Just the baseless assertion to round out with. So, as always, go and let New Horizons TV, or whatever it's called. Yeah, New Horizon TV. No, at Nathan Oakley 1980 sent me. And we responded to your lack of any effectacy in the case of Coriolis on a globe Earth. Definitely not any, according to this Muppet. I mean, this highly valued videographer that I'd like you to let know we've commented on his video and hopefully he'll return the love and leave a link to our video. Okie dokie. But, but what you did today and what the video did today was display the sophistry that's out there and how people just listen and say, oh, okay, well, that explains it. But then no one engages, no one does research, no one uses logic, reasoning. Wait a minute, but if that, then this... No one does that anymore. They just take it in, programmed by the media and the powers to be. Indeedy. I've right, still got five minutes left on the live show. Not often that we get our way through a whole video, mainly because it was only three minutes long. <laughs> but there we go, 110 yeah, well, people I try, watching. I try to give you a breather on some days. Now, tomorrow's will be short too, but it'll be very excited. Oh, okay. What's on the agenda for tomorrow? Oh, you'll have to wait till tomorrow. Okay. It, well, it's, let's put it this way. Uh, we're going to go to hell and back. Earth, <laughs> Earth Geography Office. Ego. Via a super chat from Godzilla. These, so you, in plain English, you're saying watch out for Jaron's ego? Is that what you're saying? I think what he's saying is that rather than discussing... Uh, a subject matter with the correct definitions, uh, it's going to be an ego issue rather than seeking for the truth based on definitions and what it tells us. Okay. It sounds like everybody around me has got really low expectations for my encounter with Jaron this evening. I'm interested in hearing it, uh, but I have low expectations out of Jaron uh, because he's only ever proven uh, to do the wrong thing in my experience uh, observing him and his actions okay can I, I say something uh, that will, can I say something well, yeah, be quick. I, I know you're right. what Jaron is very very good at right? and this is what originally attracted me to Jaron he's very good and I mean I reckon he's the absolute best regardless of how great QE is at breaking things down, Jaron has a natural penchant for making, showing everyone just how ridiculous all this pseudoscience is. But as you know, he then throws actual science out, and has been said by others, obviously, you, QE, and other people, Adam, everybody. He throws real science out the window with the pseudoscience. Yes. So he's brilliant. Uh, no, we're not going to give the divine, divine motive, but he's brilliant at the stroke. Because I heard him only recently. I am talking about the last Globus, uh, I think it was, only last Sunday or something. And he was going through, or one of, one of, the, one of the late recent shows he had, and he was going through some of the nonsense. And the way he picks it apart, he's very, very sharp at picking apart this rubbish. But then it comes to actual science, and he's a blockhead. Now, as I said, whether that's intentional, or just ignorance, I'm not going to make a uh, claim about that right now. Right? I don't have any trust in the man because, he, if, he, if, he's, because if he's that ignorant, then I can't trust him. And if it's not ignorance, then it's dishonesty. 
Well, um, my Does my it? message to Jaron, I'm not going to read out any of his to me. It's a bit un, unreasonable. I hate it when other people do that, but there we go. Anyway, um, <clears throat> one of my my last messages was really impactful until I remembered that you wanted a specific point raising. So I ended up having a really good ending to a whole string of messages to Jaron in lieu of our meeting this evening or this afternoon for him. And um, I ended up strapping on the end the point that you wanted me to reiterate with him. So in the commentary on Toon versus Jaron, one of the things that Jaron pointed out to me was that they can just acquire a tangent plane. Therefore, it's easy to do on a sphere. That's celestial navigation. Now, in response, at the time on the video itself, when we were doing it live, my response was to say, you can't get a tangent. We haven't got no Atmo date. And Brian corrected me and said, no, 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 you've missed what Toon's actually saying here. He's claiming Dingleberry Earth, a line extending from his feet out into space. Now, for triangulation and triangles, then the ground position has to meet that line that they call a tangent out in space with Dingleberry Earth dangling beneath. So I also strapped that onto the end of my prolonged messages where I really didn't want to take my proactive focus away from hypothesis construction. I did it just out of respect for you, Brian. So the last thing you actually got was your point. Wait a minute. <laughs> Wait a God. Rotten, cotton picking minute. I've been said that. What? Like two weeks ago. We all know that. It's just me. I made a mistake. That was all, Eli. Don't take it personally. It was me. I just identified the wrong tangent to debunk. I heard tangent and went to instinctually debunking the line to the physical earth curve edge. Because that's what I always think they're talking about. In this instance, I was just wrong. What was actually being referred to by Toon in this instance was the Dingleberry Earth tangent plane out from the feet to space. But then it doesn't have a 90 degree position below the star on the ground anymore. And if they put the ground position on the ground on the ball, it's not at 90 anymore. So, you I know, what, what's, that interesting is that, um, it, what's interesting is, um, so I, I had an objection from someone that I, that I had spoken to privately where he said initially that he didn't like our, our argument because, uh, because you can have a tangent. And I said, not if it's in relation to the ground. And he's like, yeah, it's a good point. So well, it's like, I, I think they do understand that. It's like, well, why would you think that when it when it comes to celestial navigation, we're doing in anything but we're getting angles just because? What? <laughs> well, the, my answer to it is, although you are correct, Eli, like, what you gave is the correct answer. So I'm not, this is not a, a try, me attempting to one up you. Uh, uh, my answer to it is the dip correction. Because, and I, I'm going to reiterate, I'll probably re reiterate this in our thousand times, because that requires the water that's at your horizon, regardless of the distance to the horizon, to be in an exact horizontal with the water underneath your boat. Because you're, that's what you're using to create uh, a two 90 degree angles, one at the observer and one at the GP of the celestial body. Now, when they say tangent plane, what they're actually, and Phil said it, Phil, Dr. Phil, or Professor Phil said it in, to Mitchell in the video yesterday, or that night when he said it, that it's aligned down to their geometric or refracted horizon, which is below surface level, below the horizontal. From on, If you make a horizontal, there are a straight line underneath the boat, because uh, they don't have a horizontal, they just have a straight line called a tangent. If you make a line down below that to their because their, their horizon is going to be below that tangent. That's the problem. And they're going to have to then bring up that line to the eye line. But that's going to be a greater correction than what height of eye is, because that height of eye is dip correction. The, the dip correction is the height of eye. So it doesn't matter if you bring the vertex from the eye line down to the water underneath the boat, or bring the line that's at the horizon up to the eye line. It's only the exact same amount of correction. So what they need to correct, for, what their correction is, is a greater correction because it's greater than two horizontal planes, um, the differential between two horizontal planes. It's one horizontal plane and a correction down to a curved surface. Gotcha. So or you're saying when they, when they assert yeah. or infer that the dip correction is utilising a tangent, that is where my black swan, oh, what is it, no atmo day for your straight line to a geometric horizon? Hey, you're listening in, Rufy. How's that geometric horizon yeah. working out for you? Well, that is the right response in that regard. 
but you've also incorporated the more pertinent point, which is to say that when they're drawing out a tangent plane, they've got a dip correction to a geometric horizon below surface level. And when you correct it, the correction itself, that's dip angle correction, is only ever corrected to the horizontal, either eye line or sea level, or whatever the boat sat on. Yeah. So therefore, when you're correcting to horizontal, number one, you're correcting to horizontal. Earth's flat. That's why you're doing it. Number two, what's that? No, we're correcting from a tangent point. Well, then the correction is going to be a mile off because your physical geometric tangent point debunked by the black swan below surface level will give you a much greater correction than simply how far above sea level level you are. Yeah, good point, Brian. But you're right. And, until yeah, today, the penny hasn't really deep, dropped. Deeper than that. What, 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 made you, what made the penny drop today was you saying they, they're always going to have to correct to the sea level, the surface level, the, the water level. That's the correction, right? That, that, that was the thing that made it cement in my mind today where the penny... You kept saying well, previously, the penny hasn't quite dropped with you and you were right. Well, it's, it's, more, it's more... Well, you see, if you try and make that argument that you're bringing the vertex down to sea level, they'll try and claim that, no, you're bringing the line that's going to the horizon up to the eye line. And that's where they try and beg the question, right, of a correction from a geometric horizon up to their oil line. So they're creating a horizontal at the oil line, right? But right. the problem with that is it's the only correction is based on the exact height of oil of the observer, uh, uh, between the observer's oil line and the water directly underneath that Gotcha, boat. gotcha. So, so, so in essence, I'm missing yeah. a step. So rather than, because in my mind, while you're going through it now, I stopped because that's normally where you get pissed off me because I'd interrupt and go, but they haven't got a geometric horizon. They haven't got a tangent point. You're like, no, no, no. Make sure you address that point first, which is to say, no, the correction's only ever too horizontal based on your height above sea level. It's a height of eye correction rather than their inference that dip is to the geometric horizon. You're saying, stop. Stop pointing out Black Swan at that point. Point out that the correction's to surface level first. Correct? Well, yeah, or more. Or, or eye level. You're either bringing your eye down yeah. to the surface level or you're bringing the surface level up to your eye line, both horizontal in both instances, correct? Yeah, and your height of eye correction is only for that height of your eye above the water. Yes. So if you imagine within their paradigm, if they are using a tangent plane, then their horizon has to be lower than that tangent plane. Yes. So which the means they're claiming a correction that yes. doesn't exist. I got you. Now, it's finally, yeah. it's finally sunk in. It's, it's only taken about a year and a half from you shouting at me that it's not relevant or important. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I just want you to get it. I want you to have it because I know all the tricks they're pulling because I've made videos on this. I know uh, well, every uh, response they get. It's quite appropriate you know? to round out on actually because we were just talking about Jaron. Right. In the same vein, right, I remember this distinctly. It's not often Brian tells me off, but he was fuming with me and he t properly tore a strip off me. Right. I'm sure you remember, Brian. Don't need to affirm. But the reason was because. Brian's just said a very key statement. I've got goosebumps. Very appropriate segue. You just wanted me to know. You want me to understand it. Why? Because if I understand it, I'll do better, correct? Exactly. Right. I want the same for Jaron. I want him to understand how the scientific method proves and why that would be useful to someone who hasn't got proof to claim. And throwing the baby out with the bathwater, by all science, does not prove... Because the, the the vast majority of what is claimed to be science isn't, is what I'm hoping to get across to him because I want him to do better. I don't want to critique him with Toon. I want to praise him. That's it. Yeah, I understand that. I totally understand that. Perfect. And with the dip correction argument, I have an extra to add on to that to absolutely obliterate the ballers after you've obliterated them. But it doesn't matter. We won't go into that now. All that matters is the, what, what, the part today we've talked about. Oh, we That's will. the main we'll, part. We will yeah. get into it in the after show. So, saying that, when I press my button. Catch ourselves to a lame duck. Maybe when Jaron breaks his heart this time, he'll face the fire that he needs to leave that guy alone. Quick shout out to Richard G. Super chat right at the end. He says, use it or lose it. Didn't want to interrupt the show with my free super chat. Super chat's a contradiction in terms, but thank you very much for the super chat all the same. And it did cost you money. You remember, still cost you to be a member, not free. 
Can I ask you a question? Hopefully. Uh, oh, go no, he's gonna go oh, with no. So someone else wants to ask you something. <laughs> <laughs> go on, right. some, someone else from Discord trying to ask you something there. I might wait if you want. I don't think there's a Q2 quiz, Nathan. Go ahead, Brian. Okay. Okay. You know, they are, you know, within their mathematics, every single horizon ever in history and now and forever is always a refracted position, right? Because their geometric horizon is only in the map, right? Which means that they can't use their height above sea level to know where the, the distance to the horizon is. All they can do is use something, let's say the black swan photograph, and take that horizon that we just call 10 miles, which could be a lot further, but we just call 10 miles, and then they must back calculate what that, how much over 6R must be added right, to their geometric uh, globe earth to allow for that horizon to be that far away. Now, that's just the distance. So they're working off at the distance. So they must know the distance to back calculate how much over 6R they need to add. So without knowing the distance, they can't back calculate that. So when you're out at sea, right, this is just an extra. Now, no, I'm not saying bring this to words, Darren, right, because you, you start confusing things if you, have, if, you, if you put it up. But if you're out at sea and you don't have to go far because of angular size changes before all you can see is... is See around you. There's not there's no demarcation points like oil rigs. Then with, within their claims, right, of their claims to do with dip to a geometric or to a globe's horizon that will always be beneath the, the tangent plane that they've created, then they must first know how far away that horizon is before they can do anything. Because they can't use their geometric calculations based off of their height above sea level, right? They can't use those because then why would you need dip corrections in an almanac when all you would need is the corrections that are based on that are based on a geometric flow? Because oh well I'm ten foot above the water, so I know that the horizon is always that geometric horizon is always blah blah X amount of distance away from me because I'm ten foot above the water. I know there's this much dif difference between my oil line where that horizon geometric horizon is. So I know how much to correct for. It would be a, it would be a globe out geometric correction, but that doesn't exist. There is no it, the geometric horizon is only in the mass. So because they claim that every horizon is a refracted position, and it changes constantly as we're like, like they, they say it changes constantly because they have to because the real horizon does change in distance constantly from the observer. So consequently, how could they ever? ever do dip correction without first within their paradigm, this is, working purely within their paradigm, without first knowing the distance to this refracted horizon. And without demarcation points, you can't even give an, a, a kind of an average distance. We don't even know if it's 10 miles to the, 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 the horizon behind the, the oil rigs in the Black Swan. We don't even know that. We just say 10. 10 QB just said 10, just as, because it's definitely past nine, right? But it could be 15, could be 20. The point is, is that we, to know what they need to know, we would need an almanac that magically changes, that God is changing, right, at a constant rate. So when they go to look at, when we, they must first see the, how far away the horizon is, right, correction in their almanac. That's what they would first need. They would first need to know the distance to the horizon, and they'd need an almanac that when they open it up, it gives them, via God, their distance to, the, to their horizon at that point before they could even start doing anything as far as a dip correction goes. Right, it's convoluted. Which I'm, sure, yeah. I'm sure you could even cite that by looking at page 87 on some celestial navigation book where it goes through the convoluted gaggle screw you've just been through to do dip correction, but then declares at the end that nobody ever does that and just correct the height above the sea level. No, they don't, because they don't, they don't mess with over 6 or at all, you see. See, all that over 6R nonsense, none of that is in celestial navigation. The ballers thought it was, they thought that the, that the dip correction has over 6R added in, but it's not over 6R that's added in. It's these days the dip correction has celestial uh, refraction below 20 degrees above the horizon added in. But the, 
that they, uh, that was only a recent thing. They didn't have that decades ago. They just had one table for dip, and then you had to work out separately the refraction, right? But that has nothing to do with the horizon. That's to do with the celestial body in relation to the horizon. It's about the, the, the apparent rise and fall rate of the, of the celestial body, right? The horizon is still staying a constant. Remember, with the sextant, the horizon must be a constant. So how could the horizon be going up and down, up and down? You know, it doesn't matter if it moves further or away or closer, because the correction is still the same. So you can do a depression angle, right? And if your angle is to something that's five foot in front of your boat or 500 miles in front of your boat, it won't change the angle. The depression angle is still based off of your height of eye. So it won't change. But for them, they need to know the distance to the horizon. To do even begin to do their back calculations. You could never know that. You, anyone would know. You look at any, even a video of a boat at sea and you see an horizon. There's nothing, there's absolutely nothing to tell you how far away it is. Because there's only an optical phenomenon anyway. You never know that. But even as, an, even as a, just a calculation, like with the black swan, they would need oil rigs everywhere, something like that. that they would know an exact distance. To, right. You know what I mean? Well, they'd, well, they'd, very, so they'd, that, they'd never get it. They'd never so get that, it. You, I was that, just thinking, hold on one second. I just want to just address that very last point from Brian. You're saying they'd need oil rigs everywhere. Well, yeah. they'd need something to demarcate distance. But in the Black Swan, does it ever match up with any of the oil rigs at all, ever? In other words, the chances of you getting a horizon to perfectly match with a demarcation point at 9.6 miles, like in the case of the oil rigs, is zero as far as I'm concerned. But they'd never be able to achieve yeah. it, is your point. Yeah, it's unachievable to know how far away the horizon is. Unachievable. Adam has something to say. He, 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 he talked to me about this before, I think. Now, here, here, here's a good question to them. You, because they 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 always reverse the burden of proof onto us and say, well, uh, how did you account for refraction, right? Well, guess what? <laughs> like if you're if you're navigating using the celestial bodies, how do you account for refraction? Then suck it, motherfucker. <laughs> nice right. Can nice. I nice can I interject right. on something here? Brian's right, uh, but I think you got to ask the right question. And if you ask the right question, you're going to get a better answer. So dip, correction, high to high, and refraction. Why are they involved? What's the purpose of it? What, why are all these corrections needed? And why are they essential to celestial navigation? The level, to ascertain level. Yes, yes, yes. But a little bit more, let me add. So when you realize that 90 degrees is 5,400 nautical miles, right? So what, what, what demarks that? Oh, a star, a sun, a moon. Oh, when it's directly above you, it's at 90. And when it's at the horizon and just about to go away from us and you can't see anymore, that's a zero. So over the Earth, it's 5,400 nautical miles over a flat plane. That doesn't mean the plane ends. Plane could keep going on. It's just that that's it. Okay. Well, if that's it, and you're going to use the star, right, for the angular relationship over the plane, the most you get is 90. And the most 90 is times 60 nautical miles is 5,400 nautical miles. But that doesn't mean the horizon, there's a drop off there. That's just as far as it is because you can't see that star to use for the angular measurement again. Okay, now, that being said, let's dive in deeper to the question I posed. Refraction is for flat Earth, because as that star or sun gets closer to the horizon, you've got all that slowing down thing, and it's not exactly where it's supposed to be because of the temperature of the air, not Earth curve, not coming from behind the Earth curve. It's never that in the celestial books. It's about air temperature and sea temperature. Well, guess what? We've got to make sure that we have the right altitude at that place where air temperature affects where that altitude of that star is that I'm shooting with the sextant, you know, below 10, 15 degrees. 
the purpose for refraction tables and the maximum is 34 minutes. It's already in the tables, 34 minutes. Okay, so they've already got the number. They already know what it is. And they're saying, what's the purpose for it? To establish a true 90 for the altitude to be read properly. Refraction is a flat earth proof. Dip, which is height of eye, is getting your eyeball at the sea level, which means, as Brian said, from you, somewhere in the ocean where you can't see any landmarks, to that star as it hits that horizon and disappears. That's 5,400 miles at sea level, flat, no diverging GPs. The, this is so flat earth related, plane related, not globe related. They've stolen refraction and said that something coming from over the curve causing something. No, it's to establish a true level. So the altitude of the star could be read properly over the plane so that you could subtract the right number from 90. I'm done. Yeah, that's the problem. They need a distance to to even back engineer all that, right? What Ken just said. They need to know, and they can't ever back engineer it because they can't put two nineties on the surface of their of their sphere, and have the two of them joined by a horizontal baseline. You can't do that. You can't. You know what I mean? You can't have two tangent planes at two different angles to each other. That's not what you do. <laughs> the whole thing is a mess for them. That's right. And they never use the surface uh, in their globe dingleberry because in their ding dingleberry picture, they have to put a tangent plane on the surface that matches the equatorial plane, which is really the Earth we live on. Just erase that circle that represents a globe and say you're measuring a flat, you're making all the corrections, so it's a true 90 based on the altitude above zero. That's what refraction and dip is for to get the proper altitude above zero. And then you're just drawing a circle and saying, oh, we'll just pretend we're a globe, we'll do a tangent plane on top of it. And guess what? Uh, we're really not getting it from that either because we're really getting it from the center of the earth, the equatorial plane, which all their books say they are. Oh, and by the way, when you do this, uh, the earth is stationary and the stars are spinning because it works easier that way. Can the audience please wake up if you're a baller? You've been lied to. It's sophistry. Well, they can never get to the center of their earth because they can't create the thing they need to, which is the ninety, which is the the, the elevation angle in the first place. They have well, they're to they're never, the, well, they're the never at seconds. the center of the earth. They're using the flat plane we live on and transposing it to the center so they can have their ball. Yeah, but that's my point. Like they can never get to, they can never start putting that down there because to do that whole process to get the angle need to put down there, they need to create a right angle triangle elevation angle. That's the point. Something they can't do. They deny. You know when you rock the sextant to create the zenith from the GP. Yeah. You know, right. Uh, so when you do that, right, within their paradigm, that doesn't exist. Correct. Right, and the 90 at the GP will be not 90; it'll be less than 90, and the angle on, on, on and that'll be on one tangent plane, and the other tangent plane that the observer is on, right, will be at a different angle to that tangent plane, and they'll have an angle greater than 90. Correct. Do you know what I mean? And the tangent planes won't be using the same the same flat baseline. The whole thing is a is a complete and utter mess. Correct. 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 Adam, are you going to say something earlier? Words. It's speaking of what? Speak, speaking of the Earth being stationary, here's an argument I don't know if anyone's thought of. They say when they're flying over the Earth, they're flying in great circle routes, which is the shortest distance, which that's true on a sphere. The great circle route is the shortest distance from point A to point B, right? However... I don't, they didn't take Coriolis into account for this shortest distance thing because the planes. Don't fall for that trick. 
Great Circle Rail is a straight flight. It's a top-down view. It's a straight line. To show in the orthographic view, it looks like it's not a straight line. Yeah, but that Coriolis has nothing to do with that. Coriolis is only a visual, an optical phenomenon. So it wouldn't have, and it only happened in the non-inertial reference frame. So, the, but their claim of Coriolis is that we see the stars move, but it's only apparent that it's actually us rotating. But that's only something that can be observed from a non-inertial reference frame to an inertial reference frame, giving us the optical illusion of something rotating or moving when it's actually you that's rotating. So there's no way they'd have to bring in Coriolis into that because you're in the wrong reference frame for us out. Okay, but real quick though, they say the planes are flying great circle routes because it's the shortest route that you can take. And that trace is a straight, you know, a straight curved line, a not the straight meaning not going left to right over the globe. So um, they didn't factor in Coriolis though, because when you, when you say you were to shoot a ballistic from the North Pole of the equator, the ballistic goes straight in the inertial frame. And in the non-inertial frame, it would take a curved path. But that is the shortest distance that the ballistic can fly. Is that straight line path in the inertial frame? That doesn't trace out a great circle route. If you're tracing out a great circle route when there's Coriolis involved, you're not flying the short, you're not going the shortest distance. The shortest distance would be in the inertial frame, the straight line that the ballistic takes. You can find many citations from colleges and universities about this saying the ballistic actually travels in a straight path. That's why they have to initiate a pseudo force because they're acting, they, they say, well, if there was a force there, this is what it would be, but there isn't actually one. So we know that the actual path is the, is in the inertial frame. So if the planes were, if, if there's a claim on the table, the planes are flying the shortest path. If that was the actual case, it would be tracing a curved path on the, on the ground if Earth was rotating on the globe. But are you saying, uh, is that Rob? Oh, my name's Jeremy. Hey, Rob. How we doing, Brian? Uh, sorry, oh, oh, Jeremy, sorry. I get you mixed up with Rob, some of you have similar voices. No, they, they, I understand what you mean. What you're saying is they couldn't be taking those short paths even over a sphere if the sphere is rotating, is what you're saying. No, I'm saying Which if they were exactly. taking the shortest path, if they were taking the shortest path, it would definitely not, tra it would definitely not trace out a great circle route because the line would have to curve to the left or the right because the shortest path is in the inertial frame, the place, the plane, or the, or the ballistic or whatever is actually traveling. That's the real path of the, of the object. Yeah, but that, that's part of what, well, I understand what you're arguing. Uh, uh, that if you go to my channel and look at the London, the Accra flight, that will back up what you're saying there because that's what I was pointing at with that, is that to get from London to Accra within their paradigms, then they must travel double the distance and take a, take a route that won't match their great circle route, route which they will, they'll have to take a, a route that will deviate from London to South Asia to meet up with Accra, if you know what I mean. They can, Did you hear what I said? Hopefully you hear what I said. East to west, west to east. Sorry? Sorry, Jeremy. Nathan, did you hear what I said? Uh, I know I heard you, Brian. He could be getting coffee. Ah, man. Uh, did you hear what I said about the about the actual path and all that? I wasn't paying attention. I'm really sorry. Okay, there's a claim on the table that planes are flying in the shortest path uh, over a globe that's rotating, right? And that path traces out a great circle route on the ground. But, however, we know that the actual path of anything when there's Coriolis involved is in the inertial frame, right? You throw a ball over a merry-go-round, the ball's actually going straight. It just appears to deviate because you're rotating underneath it. So... That being said, um, if they were actually flying the shortest path, um, they would go in a straight, you know, a straight line. They would basically lead the target. They would fly where the airport is going to be, not make, not, 
not constantly adjust for it. Because just like a bullet, if you were to shoot a ballistic from the North Pole to, set to the equator on their globe, the ballistic flies in a straight line. That's the shortest path in the inertial frame. That doesn't trace out a great circle route. That traces out a curved line, left to right curved over on the surface. You know what I mean? Kind of. All right, so there you're saying that the, the whole path that they take is completely wrong to what they're supposed to be actually doing if it was a ball earth with Coriolis. Yeah, I'm saying that's not the short. The shortest distance would be to fly in a straight line in the inertial frame, just like a ballistic does. And, it, and that does not trace out a great circle route on the ground. On the ground, it would trace out a line that's curving left to right. I pitched this to QE a few, I don't know, a couple months ago, but he told me that uh, it'd get too confusing if you started talking about inertial and non-inertial reference for you to shit. I mean, how about if we just you. say, how about if we just say prove the globe as an R value before you uh, claim? No, because it's uh, because what great circle great route, circle route is, is, is what they claim is a line on the globe so it's the it's just the curve over over the 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 arc but he's talking about from left to right except there is no left to right but look at master b for the pictures i just posted yeah can it's i just the, ask a question sorry uh, sorry thank you once I, I i thought you were finished no no just go master b for the pictures um you gotta assume your globe you gotta assume the arc of the protractor and when you look at a top down, it's straight. When you look at orthographic, it looks like a great circle round. It's just a trick. Yeah, that's where I was going to go. You know, my question of is there any evidence that a great circle route is a circle? I've yet to get any evidence from Wolfie or any of them ran from that. Any it's evidence that tons a great of begging the question fallacies in this whole. Yeah. There's tons of begging the question fallacies in this but, but, it's, it's but working you, within their But mouth. you see, the, the, the point is, like if the curve is left to right. That, okay. That's that's the problem, because that's not that's actually not the case. Yeah, if you were flying the shortest path, if they were doing what they said and flying the shortest path, they would be flying in a straight line in the inertial frame. That's the shortest path the plane can fly. That's the frame that the plane is in. You can find citations from universities and colleges saying that when you shoot a ballistic, it's actually going in a straight line in the inertial frame and it just appears to curve. We know this, which is why if they wanted to fly in the shortest, di shortest distance with a plane, it wouldn't not trace a great circle out because that, in the inert, if you go straight in the inertial frame, it's not gonna trace a straight path in the, on the ground, it's gonna trace a curved path, meaning left to right. Right. If the earth turned underneath. If the earth had turned underneath. Yeah. He used the bullet as the example, though, didn't he, Adam? So he's like saying if, if their claim that the earth turned underneath the trajectory of a bullet is true, well, then it's back to, well, an earth turning underneath stuff. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure if he's describing um, Brian Mullins criticism or Brian's logics. I know Brian, Brian's bringing in the acrophyte, but that, that requires differentials. Whereas Brian Mullins is two reference frames. That's what was his point. Um, but I'm not sure what you're saying. Are you saying if I fire a bullet, which I know to go straight and mark the points, it will demonstrate deviation on the map? In, in their model, I'm saying in their model, if you were to fire a bullet, the bullet goes straight. But it would, but it would, if you were to mark it on the ground, it would take a curving path. Yeah, if you were to mark it on the ground, it'd be like curving left to right, depending on which way. That'd be nice to be demonstrated. Well, I know, I hear that. I know this is filled with tons of begging the question fallacies. I, I realize that, but I'm just working in their model because they're making a claim about their model. Short as this. No, no, no I'm, I'm, I'm talking about a real life demonstration fire a bullet straight firing point landing point point them on a map and show me it's not a straight line 
uh, or shown me that the deviation is commensurate in some form or another to anything other than turbulent. I mean, I just think it's a killer for their claim of planes are flying the shortest, shortest path distance. Yeah, it's these things seem like a slam dunk when you're talking about multiple reference frames on a globe Earth. The problem is that if you ever actually get into a discussion and it's with an anti flat earther, someone who's this, that's in, on the scene, what you'll find is they will just change their claim midpoint. So while you're pointing out how there's this effect of Earth's turning underneath, at some point in the discussion they'll say, well, Earth's not turning underneath. They move as one reference frame. That's what they'd say to you. Well, I, I've been over the up and down over this with Zanuck, Poe Show, all them guys, and uh, they bring it to you know, they always just uh, start mixing up the reference frame and say, well, from this reference frame, uh, this is the shortest distance. But they'll say there is no actually, there is no like actual path. It all depends on which reference frames you're in. Like it's just it's a mess when you get into it with them. I know. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, but they don't claim reference frames. They claim one reference frame. But, the, but that's not that's not the the uh what do you call it that's not the general understanding uh or the or the globe models claim because there is 15 degrees well no well they say there's 15 degrees an hour and they even give you an example of airplanes so you can't have an airplane not not showing a curved path it, there has to be a path that it it, it would be calculating two that's not at that point when you take off which would be the curve jeremy's talking about jeremy's not got a curve it doesn't exist the only the only curve is the arc over the surface as for that it's still a straight see the plane flies from a to b in a straight line you know air traffic control permitting but fundamentally it does that now if you then take those Things and express them as a great circle route, which is a straight line, yeah, expressed as a radio uh, as the radial value. You're putting it on a ball, so it will curve up and down in the x-axis, but it, it's still straight with regards to the, exactly. the, the only deviation is in the altitude or relative altitude from your starting point. Exactly, and that's what destroys them. That's that's the point of the the, the 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 Coriolis argument in this sense, because it has to curve left to right. We're confusing Coriolis and great circle routes. No, I'm not sure. I'm not the, sure what if, the, what if it's turning underneath, then it's deviating from that straight arc that it would be flying over from point A to point B, if it was turning underneath like they claim. No, but they don't claim that. Yeah, they do. It's right there. No, the no, no, they, claim, they claim they're no. They claim the Earth is rotating at fifteen degrees per hour, but also the second reference frame is in lockstep with that. Therefore, net effect zero. No, no, no. Hold on. Let's go. Let's go directly to. Hold on. Coriolis effect. Yeah, that's how oh, we well, know let me not Google it while I'm because on there's no hold effect on. to measure. Eli, you know Adam it's is telling you, Eli, yeah. Adam is telling you the anti flatherers position. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying their position is separate from the generally accepted tr truth of the globe. Is that their position has nothing to do with what you'll find on Google. No, but what they'll then try to do yeah. is where Brian, and this is where Brian's point comes in, is to try and initiate a retained bastardization of angular momentum and tangential speed so that your plane in the lockstep atmosphere also retains its sideways movement based on the rotation but it only retains that from the point of takeoff so that you've got a, a, a differential at the rotation points um, from when you take off and where you are i.e. the Earth is slightly moving different, and it, that's the Coriolis that they then try to account for now, because basically planes take off backwards, or can. Yeah, from I got a citation from so, National Geographic. The weather impacts fast-moving objects such as airplanes and rockets.
is influenced by the Coriolis effects. The direction of Aurelian winds are largely determined by the Coriolis effects, and pilots must take that into account when charting flights path over long distances. See, that's not the anti. Yeah, they oh, claim that's not, that. that's not that's not the anti claim, and that's what I'm saying. Their argument is debunked by their own. Well, this right here. Their apologetic yeah, is is, that... is just baseless assertion. Sorry for yeah, they claim that they're, they're uh, correcting. Uh, uh, one second, one second. What was just read out there is not the Coriolis effect. That's Globiolis nonsense. Coriolis effect does nothing, does, uh, it doesn't create anything, it doesn't cause anything, it's an effect, an optical phenomenon, that's all it is. So anything to do with hurricanes or winds or any rest of it, nothing to do with Coriolis, right? The Coriolis effect is just a, an observed optical phenomenon. But forget all of that, yeah, right? They... Ignore, hang on, ignore all of that and go straight to London, London to Akragana floods. Because all of that is negated by that flight, because that's a direct north to south flight. There is none of that happening or can be claimed within their model when it comes to that flight. None of it can that's be the claimed. Point. There's no Coriolis can be claimed. There's no convolution of Coriolis. There's no uh, conservation of momentum. It's a direct north to south, and within their model, the Earth must rotate underneath the plane, and the pilot must account for that rotation. Right? Yeah, that's, that the, that's the point. That, that's, that, the point that's the point that, that they're making, that, because that's the they're point. saying is making, that... Yeah. I guess not... That, cool. that, no, that, uh, no, no, you don't... It, 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 it's, it's in the same vein, but it's not exactly... It's not, it, well, the argument you're making, I bypassed all of that with that argument. There's none of that. There's no convolution. I don't have to argue about Coriolis or any of the rest of it, because there's nothing to do with that direction. There is no conservation of momentum of either linear or angular, there's none of that. The pilot must account for an earth rotating underneath it, underneath the plane, if the earth is doing that. There, there is no That's accounting the point. That's in the... any way, and the, the route they'd have to take would be completely different than the route they take. And the distance they'd have to travel would be over 6,000 miles and not over 3,000 miles. So there's no way out All of right. it. That's, That's why you go, to, you, you go to my channel and look at that. I have two videos on it. They have nothing, literally nothing. Okay, that's the point. They claim that the pilots are correcting for Coriolis over the whole course of the flight. No, which means no, you're missing the point. No, Jeremy, you're they're... completely missing it. No, so why do you keep shutting us down, it, bro? Elbow tried to get no, in, and I tried to get in. What's your problem, Brian? Hold off. You're missing Hold the off. point. Hey, can, can, can you can you Hold control them? Because that's, that's, that's... Hello. <laughs> Hold you. off for a second. This is going to end in a train wreck, and the reason why it's going to end in a train wreck is you're talking about three different contexts all at once. Number one, you got Globiolis. Number two, when you say they and there, you don't know, you're not identifying who it is because it depends on who you're talking to, right? The contexts that are out there that are a joke are Globiolis, the anti-flat earthers claim, and then what actually Coriolis is. Now, you guys are going to get into a knockdown, drag out fight here for about two hours. Over because no one is is establishing what context that they're speaking in. Hello? Yeah, but I'm not talking about Coriolis at what? all because that doesn't come into the London Aqua flight. But that's what I'm saying. He is. Yeah, I know, but that's what I'm trying to correct them on. That that, that <laughs> instead of getting into a wrangle dangle about east to west and west to east and what they claim about Coriolis and what is actually being claimed as just called Globiolis. All of that is negated. Because there is no you north to south, south to north. But you can't say correcting when correct. your point is different, if it's different. I don't see a difference. It's your point is kind of incorporated in what he's saying. It, like if you if you drop the no. globulus coriolis uh no, rhetoric. There's none of that in my but, point. Why are you why are you interrupting me, Brian? Because I'm trying to I trying to show you something. I, but I waited right? till you finish. So I'm just okay. asking why aren't you giving me the courtesy? Yeah, Brian. Thank you. Okay, I apologize. Thank you, thank you, brother. All I'm saying is there's nothing wrong with him saying, let's let's take, for example, something going from north to south, knowing that there's an east to west rotation. There, if you were to draw that line on the floor, 
that that there is no curve there. You're just going from point A to point B. There would have yeah. to be if there was any movement. It, we agree. So it's like without all the rhetoric, it, it's, he's not incorrect. You're just saying forget all that. No, I'm not saying forget all that. I'm saying what I'm trying to say is when you deal with north to south or directly north to south and directly south to north, all their claims, all their convolution of Coriolis and all the convolution of the angle, the conservation of angle of, of momentum, angular and linear, the way they convolute the two and switch between them, all that is nullified. So they can't bring up Coriolis or Globiolis. They can't bring up the conservation of momentum because all of that is nullified by that direction. Because within their model, that whole Globiolis conservation of momentum nonsense that only happens east, west, and west east. There, they, that is not accounted for and can't be north to south and south to north. Which means that a flight leaving London, flying to Accra in Ghana, which is on the same longitude line directly south, means that the flight, the person flying that plane must account for an out-rotating underneath him. And that would mean the plane would have to fly faster than the plane can fly, it would have to fly double the distance they actually fly, and uh, uh, and they'd have to take a completely different path if the Earth was a rotating globe. Therefore, the Earth is not a rotating globe. But with that, I'm going to say another huge, massive, enormous thank you to both Discord and G Plus panels for making today's after show possible. And of course, a massive thank you to all of you in either Nathan Oakley 1980 or Nathan Oakley primary streams. Hopefully, smashing the super chat, liking, commenting, sharing, subscribing, joining as a Nathan Oakley 1980 channel member, and all that good stuff. I've been Nathan Oakley and I will see you all in the next video.